Good afternoon. Yesterday, the President of the United States incited an armed insurrection against America. In the hours after the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, Democrats moved swiftly to try and remove Donald Trump from power. I joined the Senate Democratic leader in calling on the vice president to remove this president by immediately invoking the 25th Amendment. Much to their dismay, then Vice President Mike Pence rejected the idea of using the 25th Amendment, saying it would set a terrible precedent. It is the Vice President. The President needs to speak up more forcefully against what happens there. But that didn't stop House Democrats from rapidly moving ahead with the second impeachment of Donald Trump. House Resolution 24. On January 13th, one week after the attack on the Capitol, the House voted to impeach Donald Trump. He must go. There was some bipartisan support for impeachment. Ten House Republicans voted to impeach, and later, during the Senate trial, seven Republican senators. Still, Trump was acquitted. What we saw in that Senate today was a cowardly group of Republicans. Democrats and Republicans can do good work together. By May 2021, many members from both parties had agreed on the need for a bipartisan, independent 9-11 style commission to investigate January 6th. The plan was to have an equal number of Republicans and Democrats investigating. But soon, Republicans mischaracterized the effort and balked. I've made the decision to oppose the House Democrats' slanted and unbalanced proposal for another commission to study the events of January the 6th. So House Democrats formed a select committee to investigate, which included Republicans Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, both of whom had voted to impeach Trump. The first public hearing was in June last year. As Americans, we all have a duty to ensure that what happened on January 6th never happens again. For many, the hearings were must-see TV. Former Attorney General Bill Barr testified. I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bullshit. This is the president's daughter. Trump's daughter, Ivanka, told the committee she agreed with Barr's summation. It affected my perspective. Um, I respect Attorney General Barr. Um, so I accepted what he said was saying. Former Trump White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson was perhaps the committee's strongest witness. His response was to say they can march to the Capitol from, in, from the ellipse. Something to the effect of take the effing mags away. They're not here to hurt me. Let them in. Let my people in. The committee subpoenaed many in Trump's orbit. Gonna have judgment. Former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon and advisor Peter Navarro were both charged for failing to comply. Bannon was convicted at trial. Navarro pleaded not guilty and is awaiting trial. The committee also says more than 30 witnesses took the fifth during questioning. Do you believe the violence on January 6th was justified morally? Take the fifth. General Flynn, do you believe in the peaceful transition of power in the United States of America? The fifth. Former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows refused to testify and Pence resisted cooperation. All the while, Republicans slammed the select committee for being partisan. Those in favor will say aye. 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 In October, the committee formally issued a subpoena to Donald Trump. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. Trump responded to the subpoena on social media, asking, why didn't the unselect committee ask me to testify months ago? He called the committee a total bust, that further divided the country. Exactly how did the committee later withdrew the subpoena and Trump never testified. Pull them, pull them this way. Still, the committee uncovered disturbing details from inside the Trump White House as the Capitol was under siege. It highlighted 187 minutes of Trump's inaction during the attack, showing how he remained in his private dining room watching coverage on Fox News for more than three hours despite pressure to put out a statement calling off the rioters. He says go home. He says go home. Nothing but the truth. The committee also revealed how a Trump-funded lawyer allegedly pressured Cassidy Hutchinson not to be transparent with the committee during her testimony. After a 17-month investigation and more than 1,000 witnesses, 
the January 6th committee just last month announced criminal referrals to the U.S. Department of Justice. We have gone where the facts and the law lead us, and inescapably, they lead us here. The committee referred Donald Trump to the DOJ for potential charges related to four crimes, assisting or aiding an insurrection, conspiracy to defraud the United States, obstruction of an official proceeding, and conspiracy to make false statements. He is unfit for any office. A criminal referral was also made for Trump's lawyer, John Eastman, who could face charges of obstruction of an official proceeding and conspiracy to defraud the United States. Eastman said the referral carried little weight because it was the product of a partisan process. Randy Kay, CNN. Well, two years it has been. Joining us, uh, CNN senior law enforcement analyst and former FBI deputy director Andrew McCabe, also CNN special correspondent Jamie Gangel. Uh, Jamie, and the duality of this January 6th, the January 6th two years ago, um, obviously very different days, some of the same people uh, involved on both of these days. I'm wondering what your thoughts were seeing that ceremony today at the White House. Well, it was quite a split screen uh, seeing the people being honored. And then this is, I think, day four of uh, the Chaos Caucus. It's watching those pictures in, in Randy's piece just brings it all back. And then you compare that to what we saw this week. Uh, a former Republican Speaker of the House, Anderson, I will let you guess which one, said to me this week as he watched what was going on with the Republican conference, quote, the suicide squad is locked in. It is like watching someone burn down their own house because the flames excite them. How we get here after what we went through uh, on January 6th, two years ago, is, is just astonishing to me. Andrew, do you think American democracy is safer now than it was two years ago? Boy, Anderson, I wish I could say I felt mm -hmm. confidently that we are, but I'm I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest. I think in the um, in the work that's been done by the committee and by the Department of Justice and the FBI and their and their partners in the law enforcement community, the, the biggest gap for me is we still haven't answered some really fundamental questions about how our law enforcement community handled the intelligence that led up to and foreshadowed the attack that happened on January 6th. Uh, the committee really just kind of gave that a very, very uh, minimal kind of glancing blow in their conclusions of that monstrous report. And we really haven't heard much from the other uh, law enforcement entities. We haven't heard anything from the FBI about an internal review to assess their performance. What, what can only be qualified as performance failures on an essential mission, preventing acts of terrorism in the United States. Um, we haven't heard anything about a process to uncover, to reevaluate what they knew, what sort of ass intelligence assessments and decisions and communications they did with that knowledge. Um, so I, I wish I could sit here two years later and say, yeah, we've learned a lot. We all understand what those lessons are, and I'm confident that our law enforcement and intelligence community has addressed those issues. But at this point, we still really don't know that. And, and Jamie, the former president, who is allegedly running again, uh, though, I mean, he still seems to be sequestered up down in Mar-a-Lago. But um, he's announced. He's announced. He has announced. I mean, has he, does he still have the power that he once did among Republicans? It's a great question because it was fascinating to see, frankly, what appeared to be his lack of influence this week, certainly with uh, picking the Speaker of the House. Yes, he endorsed Kevin McCarthy, but it was sort of tepid. Uh, he seemed to be waiting to see which way the wind was blowing. Today, he started making calls, I'm told, uh, by our colleague Caitlin Collins once uh, it looked like Kevin was going to get it. I think the question, though, isn't what happened with the speaker vote or what is happening with the speaker vote. It's what's going to happen in the primaries. It's who else is going to get in the race. Then we're really going to know, you know, has his influence diminished somewhat? Absolutely. But will it make a difference at the polls? Mm. 
Andrew, the Department of Justice says that 140 officers were injured on January 6th. Five officers died in the months after the riot. What do you think the, the legacy and the insurrection will be from a law enforcement perspective? You know, I, I hope that we can ultimately settle on a, a, a shared understanding of just how incredibly devastating that's been to the law enforcement community. I mean, 140 officers assaulted on the same day. I can't, outside of 9-11, I can't think of an event or an attack that resulted in that much carnage directed specifically at our our first responders. Um, you know, but, but we're still struggling with understanding what that legacy is. And it sometimes seems that half the country or at least half the political leadership in this country is 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 on on a path of of looking for accountability and the other half is still desperately trying to ignore things like those 140 assaults um and wash their hands of of what happened on that day in an effort to to get away from the the stink that comes with being associated with an attack mm -hmm.